Hey guys, here we are at chapter 5, part 2. We're going to be talking about evolution and biodiversity today. So we should be starting on page 124 underneath the heading that says evolution is the mechanism underlying biodiversity. Now, if you're still having trouble with your Shannon Wiener calculations, um, there's this handy section here called do the math, measuring species diversity. So if you're having trouble with that, um, please feel free to use this box. Also, email me or um, come visit me in the morning if you're still having trouble, okay? So let's talk about evolution and genetic diversity here. So evolution drives biodiversity. So it's kind of the force that pushes biodiversity along. All right, so evolution is defined as the change in genetic composition of a population over time. There's a lot of misconceptions about um, individuals evolving, and those are incorrect. Um, the only way evolution happens is to a population. Okay, so one population splits into two populations due to lots of different factors, um, or one species evolves into numerous different species that are only slightly different, like we have lots of different kinds of squirrels, lots of different kinds of, of pine trees, and things like that. So we'll talk about that. All right, but I don't want you to think that individuals evolve on their own. Like all of a sudden, we didn't have a tail. Like that's not how it goes. It's evolution over time at the population level. Okay, now above the species level, if it's like at the family level, or something like that, um, that's called macroevolution, which is the evolution of a new species, brand new species. Now that's called speciation. So yesterday when we were talking about phylogenies, we were looking at, about, we were looking at how different organisms, different species um, evolved from one common, or kind of branched off from one common ancestor, okay? Remember, we wanna think of phylogenies like family trees. Right now, below the species level, like within a single species, we have this thing called microevolution. So micro means small, macro means big, okay? Now, microevolution is gonna be the evolution of new species types. So we have many different types of apples, many different types of um, squirrels, things like that, okay? So we're not giving rise to a new species, all right? We are just um, having a new type of the same species. Okay, so speciation is macroevolution. Okay, new species types is going to be microevolution. All right, let's turn the page. Next page, we have um, some birds, and we're talking about mutations. Okay, so here we are. Okay, our next heading is going to be kind of genotype versus phenotype. Now, these should be familiar to you from biology. Okay, so genotype starts with geno, which should make you think of genes. Okay, so the genotype is the complete set of genes of an organism. A phenotype is its expressed trait. So I like to think of pheno as physical. They both start with the pH sound. Okay, so um, our genotype, let's talk about that first. We know that a gene is a physical location on a chromosome. So we have our chromosomes, and a gene is a specific location on that chromosome. Okay. Now we have two ways that genes can be kind of manipulated and moved around and um, made to look a little bit different. So let's look at those real quick. So first we have um, recombination. Okay, so recombination is what happens when there is a mistake in mitosis or meiosis. So when cells are dividing, um, if you remember from biology, usually your chromosomes have to be split apart. And so sometimes when they're not split apart perfectly, that's what happens when um, recombination happens. Okay, so they're, they're um, kind of separated, but not uniformly like we like them to be, okay? And then the other one is mutation. And so mutation is what happens when there's a mistake in the DNA copying process. So we know that when um, a cell is about ready to divide, it has to make a copy of its DNA to put in its new daughter cell. And so when there's a mistake in, D in copying the DNA for the for the daughter cell, that's when mutation occurs, okay? Now, both of these are going to increase genetic diversity. So 
you, yesterday we talked about genetic diversity and how it's important in organisms to make sure that we don't have diseases and things like that that can kind of take over. Um, my favorite example of this genetic diversity is actually bananas. Um, the bananas that you buy at the grocery store are all almost genetically identical. They come from like the same parent plants and they haven't really had any extra genes from any other plants in an extremely long time. So their genetic diversity is very low. Now, why that's bad is that if one disease, one single disease comes and hits the banana plants of the United States and the world, they will all be dead because none of them have the genetic diversity to have the gene that says, no, I'm not going to be um, susceptible to this disease, I'm going to survive. Kind of like the Black Plague with people. A bunch of people died in the Black Plague, but there were certain people who had genes that kind of helped them, you know, not die from the Black Plague. So same thing with bananas, same thing with people. Genetic diversity makes us more um, able to combat disease just using our genes. All right, next we have phenotype, which is our expressed traits. Now, they're not always gene-specific. So remember when you did the Punnett squares and stuff like that? You had the big B and the little b, okay? And you know that you have both of those genes. So your genotype, you have big B, little b, but your phenotype is going to be like blue eyes or brown eyes or whatever that big B stood for. <coughs> now, um, there's a couple of environmental factors that can change um, the phenotypes of different organisms. So we have the egg temperature of different organisms that lay, lay eggs. If they're um, laid in hot areas, they're going to, you know, be a different color or something than something with a low temperature. And scientists have done these experiments for years. Um, if there are predators around, okay, kind of like, I'll show you an example of this in a second, and then the maternal diet. Like there's a lot of, you know, talk going around about how what your mom eats when you're inside of her, you know, takes into account if you're a boy or a girl. So that definitely is um, kind of an urban myth and they, they're still trying to test it. But as far as things that they have already tested, we have um, the environmental effect on a phenotype. It's at the bottom of the page here. Okay, and so we can see that um, water fleas raised in the absence of predators produce relatively small heads and short tail spines. So this guy um, kind of looks like a balloon. He's not very intimidating. He doesn't look like he's fighting off a bunch of predators and that's because there were no predators in the water when he was born. Now, whereas individuals raised in the presence of predators produce relatively large heads and long tail spines. So this guy was brought up in an area that had a lot of predators and so he has evolved to um, or his phenotype has been um, influenced by those predators in in the water where he lives okay so this isn't really evolution it is kind of the response of your phenotype to different environmental factors All right, so we have three evolutionary processes that we're going to talk about in this chapter. And the first one is artificial selection. Now, if you have a dog or if you've eaten any produce from the grocery store, you know what artificial selection is. Okay, and that's when humans are determining which individuals breed based on useful or pretty, you know, aesthetically pleasing traits. Um, now, I have two examples here. The first one is dogs. They're human domesticated from wolves. So we had that one breed of wolves that was turned into hundreds of breeds. Okay, so all of our dog friends here, if we look at this phylogeny chart about um, our dogs, the wolf is the ancestor of the various breeds of dogs. It is illustrated at the same level as the dogs in this tree because it is a species that is still alive today. Okay, so this is the ancestor of all of these guys, but since this he's still alive today, he still has his own branch. Okay, they just mated with different things, and if you can look, remember we're thinking about family tree. 
okay? Now we also have, the other example is gonna be greens that you buy at the store. Um, they're almost all exclusively bred by humans from the mustard plant based on different traits. So one species turned into many species again. So if we look over here at figure 5.9, we can see that the ancestor is the wild mustard and it's given rise to Brussels sprouts, to cauliflower, to broccoli, to cabbage, to kale, and to kohlrabi, I think is how you pronounce that name. And so what they did is they took these wild mustard plants and they were like, wow, both of these mustard plants have really large leaves. I'm going to breed them together. Okay, and then the offspring would then have large leaves. And so then you do that over and over and over again, you get things like broccoli and cabbage and kale. Okay, at the same time, if you breed the ones that have large flowers, you're gonna get Brussels sprouts or cauliflower eventually. Okay, so all the greens that you find at the grocery store all came from this one ancestor, which I think is pretty cool. Now, next we have um, natural selection from our friend um, Charles Darwin. So that's gonna be that the environment determines which individuals survive and reproduce. Okay, so basically survival of the fittest. And this is um, the theory of natural selection is by the scientists Darwin and Wallace. They sailed together in around the 1950s on a ship called the Beagle all around the world and then um, Darwin published his On the Origin of Species book Okay, and the key ideas of natural selection are here. So one, two, three, four, five key ideas. They're also um, summarized on down here on your in your book. If you're having a hard time reading it, okay, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so first one is that individuals produce excess offspring. Okay, and that's usually true, even with People. Back in the day when people's survival rates weren't as high, um, couples would have more children in order to counteract the effects of the environment on their children's lifespan. Okay, So if there's a lot of disease or starvation or stuff like that, you'd have more to make sure that your genes are passed on. Okay, Number two is that not all offspring can survive. Okay, Like I said before, there's lots of environmental factors that, that kill babies of all species. Um, number three, individuals differ in their traits, usually based on their family or their parents or their ancestors. Okay, number four is that different traits are passed on from parent to offspring. Like you're, you don't look exactly like your mom or exactly like your dad because you have traits from both of them. All right, and number five is that differences in traits are associated with differences in the ability to survive and reproduce. So if you have more... Um, beneficial traits that you got from your parents than like say your brother or sister then you're gonna have a better chance of survival than they are okay maybe they were born um, with a disease maybe they were born um, like if you're a if you're a lion or something and they're in your brother isn't as fast as you then you're gonna be able to eat more than him Okay, so when you're thinking about evolution by natural selection, try not to think of human terms, okay, because in humans it's harder because we kind of adjust the environment to fit ourselves. Try to think about an animal, like maybe your favorite animal. Think about how that they have evolved over natural selection. Okay? <coughs> so, to recap, artificial selection, humans determine the traits that are passed on, natural selection, traits in, that improve fitness are passed on. Now, fitness is not what I mean when I say that I'm going to the gym to get fit. I mean that I'm going to have the ability to survive and reproduce. So the higher fitness that I have, the more I'm going to be able to survive and reproduce, okay? Now, there's all kinds of adaptations. Adaptations are traits that improve fitness. Um, there's different adaptations that can solve different environmental challenges. So things like the cactus. The cactus has an adaptation to where they store water. Okay, um, Some of them have long roots that get deep, deep down into the soil where, where the soil retains water and it's not um, evaporated off right away. Okay, There's a lot of cactuses that have kind of hairy surfaces or like their, their thorns. 
okay, that reduce water loss. All of those kinds of adaptations are made in order to improve their um, um, fitness. Okay. Now, our last one, our last evolutionary process is random processes. Okay. So we have, um, let's see, how many random processes that we do we have? We have four. Okay. So four random processes affect evolution. So first is going to be mutation that's usually at random. Okay. And if it's not lethal, then it's passed on and kind of increases through multiple generations if, if it's beneficial. Okay. So I really like this, this mice figure in your book on page 129. It kind of gives you the rundown, especially if you're a visual learner. It can help you out this, with that. So mutation can arise in a population, and if it is not lost, it may increase in frequency over time. So if a mutation occurs and there's lots of time and generation and, and these are not less fit, like the black mice are not less fit than the white mice, then they're going to have more black mice over time because the black mice are going to be like, oh, okay, this is not detrimental to our population. So we can have um, mates and things like that, and it can increase over time. Okay, next is going to be genetic drift, and it can work in two different ways. Okay, so our first way is going to be in a large population. So in a large population, the genetic composition tends to remain the same over time. Okay? In a small population, however, some genotypes can be lost by chance and the genetic composition can change over time. So if I have a huge population of black and white mice, chances are that over time and lots of generations, that ratio isn't really going to change unless there's a giant disturbance like a disease or something. However, if you have a tiny population of mice, eventually um, do either by chance or by preferences of the mice or anything like that, the genetic um, composition can drift, okay, and one type of species can be wiped out, okay, even by chance. It's not a disease, it's not a detrimental genetic trait or anything, it's just chance, okay, so genetic drift is all about chance, okay. Next, we have the bottleneck effect, which happens after a some sort of disaster, usually. So there's a large population that goes through this bottleneck, kind of like what you think of if you think of like a, a two-liter soda bottle or something. Um, so there's a small population. There's a change in genetic composition due to a disaster like habitat loss, hunting, or environmental change. There's a lower genetic diversity, and there's a high risk of extinction. All right, and then we have the founder effect, okay, which is our last one, which means we have a small population, also known as the founders, kind of like the Pilgrims or Plymouth Rock or something like that. We have the founders that they colonize a new area, and if they colonize a new area, then the, there's usually a change in genetic composition from the original population, and there's usually a lower genetic diversity. Okay, so in general, um, random processes actually um, decrease fitness, okay? And it's not really based on fitness. It's based on chance and disasters and other random process, not on their abilities to survive and reproduce, okay? So let's go back over here. Let's look at our mice friends for bottleneck effect and founder effect. So the bottleneck effect if a population experiences a drastic decrease in size, okay, so like, you know, let's, like, let's say there is a flood and it wiped out all of these mice except for this brown one and the two black ones, okay? Some genotypes will be lost and the genetic composition of the, survivals, of the survivors will differ from the composition of the original group. So the original group was 40% black, 10% brown, and 5% white. Now, these are the only three survivors, so our new population, is going to be 67% black, 33% brown, 0% white, white. So all of the ancestors of this bottleneck group are going to be the same composition, which is much, much different than the original. Okay, this has happened um, in the panther species in Florida, actually. <coughs> now, the last one is going to be our founder effect. If a few individuals from a mainland population colonize an island, Obviously, mice can't fly, but just work with me here. Maybe they're very strong sw swimmers. The genotypes on the island will represent only a subset of the genotypes present in the mainland population. As with the bottleneck effect, some genotypes will not be present in the new, in the new population. 
So, these four mice are super strong swimmers. They go off to this island. Now, it might be an island because there's water in between it. It might be an island because um, these ones just ventured off around the lake or something like that. Um, there was like a tree that fell and kind of dislodged these four from the rest of the, the group and they couldn't figure out how to get around it, okay? But the mainland population, 40, 10, 50, new population 25 0 75 okay so again just like with the bottleneck effect the genotype of the new population is going to be much different than the old population okay and that might be a good thing or a bad thing depending upon the genes that are present okay now that is it for day two i will see, see you tomorrow for a skittles lab <laughs>